Good evening. Good evening to all the participants. We are back. Uh, we are back with uh, session number 19. As you know, Department of English of Shadhun Chandra Mohammed Dalai has been organizing this special lecture series to cater literary help to the students in crisis. Since May, we have been conducting this special lecture series. And on our digital platform, several eminent speakers already deliver their insightful lectures. And uh, what the, from the feedback, uh, we have come to know that the students really benefited from these lectures. Today, I, Gautam Maji, Assistant Professor as well as of the Department of English, Adam Chodham, with the light, back with another eminent speaker. And uh, he is Dr. Shomi Pendro Banerjee from Gaur Bongo University. So first of all, I would like to welcome our honorable uh, distinguished guest on our digital platform. And then we would like to uh, uh, commence our lecture. So, so welcome, welcome to our digital platform. And uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation for this special lecture. Before our honorable guest uh, uh, commences his insightful lecture, I would like to uh, Say with all of you his academic career. Dr. Swamitendra Banerjee, Assistant Professor at the Department of English, uh, English um, University of Gold Bongo, has been teaching English literature at the postgraduate level for over 15 years. He has completed his MPhil from Jadavpur University and PhD from Vishnavarati Shantini Gidan on historiography and politics of post independence Indian. English drama. He is an active member of the theater community of Malda. He leads the drama club of the University of Gold Bongo and acts and directs plays with the students. This includes Brecht's Galileo and uh, Santa Soptuk, an adaptation of Carly, Carol Churchill's Seven Jewish Children in 2018 and 19. He received an international travel grant to present his research at the IFTR conference at University of Sao Paulo, Brazil in 2017. In 2019, he completed the prestigious course from the National School of Drama, uh, New Delhi. He is on the editorial board of several peer-reviewed journals. His areas of interest are modern Indian theater, women in 19th century Bengali theater, and gender studies. So we are really fortunate to have uh, this eminent speaker on our platform. So before he commences, so I would like to hear a few words from him about our bench job. So. Yes, uh, thank you, Gautam. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful introduction. I would say I'm honored. Uh, I'm really, uh, what should I say? I, I'm grateful to your college, uh, to you in particular for uh, asking me to uh, deliver some kind of a talk on uh, this this title, but yes, of course. I mean, this uh, venture that you have done and your college and your department, uh, whatever it has done, it's it's really commendable because you know these are testing times for all of us. We are forced under lockdown. We are forced to stay back in our homes, uh, particularly for the students, for the young uh, boys and girls. Uh, it has been really difficult because you see one thing that I always feel is that. If you uh, reimagine our own college days, so uh, unfortunately, a major part of their, uh, you know, semester, uh, a whole semester, they have to stay back at their homes because, you know, education is not just about uh, studying. I mean, they may be studying from their books and uh, using these online platforms, but then uh, meeting your peers, meeting your friends, uh, going to the canteen, these matter, these matter. And uh, uh, so that's very unfortunate. But but there is this online platform which has created uh, some kind of a scope for uh, 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 an exchange as well. So uh, that's that's really nice that you're doing this, and I hope you carry on doing this. Uh, Thank you yeah. very much, sir. And uh, obviously, I must extend my heartfelt thanks to you because whenever I um, uh, approached you, and uh, without a father, daily you accepted this one. So thank you very much for your friendly approach. And once again, from the core of my heart. 
And uh, the topic that you're going to deal with today, that topic is on your screen right now of affluent wives and rascal mothers, the liberal feminism of Mary Wilson Brown. So uh, this uh, he is going to deal with right now. And uh, if you have any question regarding this topic, then you can uh, drop your question in the comment box after his lecture, and I will take all the questions to him, and he will definitely answer all of your questions. So. Now I would like to hand over the entire station to your honorable sir, and I am taking myself off from the screen, sir. So, sir, now you can uh, begin your lecture. Yes, uh, yes. Thank you, Gautam, once again. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, to the particularly to the students of uh, Shadon Chandra Mahavidyalaya and others uh, who might be watching us here on Facebook Live right now, uh, I would be talking of uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, and the title, as Gautam already has mentioned is uh, of affectionate wives and uh, rational mothers, the liberal feminism of Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, uh, I was really uh, happy to learn that uh, uh, there is Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, Vindication of the Rights of Women uh, in your syllabus, a part of it, uh, because uh, at our university, at University of Gold Bongo, we also have uh, this particular text on our syllabus, and uh, I, I usually teach this text so I've been dealing with Wollstonecraft's text for quite some time. And uh, while teaching this, uh, I have always enjoyed teaching Wollstonecraft uh, because Wollstonecraft is one of the uh, pioneering figures as far as English feminism is concerned. Uh, so, uh, so Gautam, we can uh, right away start with the presentation and I will uh, ask you to pause the presentation when, uh, when we will uh, go towards the text, right? So uh, the next slide, please. <clears throat> yes, the first slide is uh, Wollstonecraft's, uh, uh, you know, a photo or image, whatever you say. And I would, uh, you know, draw your attention to the dates. It's uh, 27th April 1759 to 10th September 1797. Not much of a life. Okay. Uh, she lived for 38 years only. If you, uh, I think I'm right. Yeah. So something around that. And uh, within this short span of time, uh, she was influential tremendously through her varied writings, through her varied uh, you know, discussions and part of uh, a very vibrant uh, intellectual group that was in London, that was in England. Now, as, I, as my title has already said, I would like to engage uh, with the audience with the idea of feminism because I'm looking at uh, Wollstonecraft as part of what we understand as liberal feminism, right? So, which is why liberal is within quotes, because it's not exactly uh, liberal in the sense we understand the word today. Uh, the liberal has got a particular 18th century connotation. So we will go back to that as well. And I would like to also talk of the idea of feminism. Yes, we can move on. So the uh, three waves, we understand feminism by uh, the three waves of feminism. And uh, the first wave, as I, as I told, uh, tell you here, is suffragists, which is roughly from the 18th century to the early 20th century, which was largely concerned with a kind of a political power. The second wave is uh, beginning 1960s to present, where issues of equality beyond suffrage, uh, ending gender discrimination is one of them and greater theory comes in, uh, women's liberation comes in, and we also move gradually towards uh, what we understand as liberal, what we understand as radical feminists. The third wave, which is again understood as beginning 1990s, and for some stemming from the perceived failures of the second wave, it incorporates greater diversity and brings in, uh, of course, the diverse issues of gender, the broader issues of the gender. And it's very interestingly, it's also more self-assertive, more uh, aggressive. We, we talk of uh, the cyber girls. Uh, there's a girl rhetoric. Okay, the web, the internet becomes an important platform. here. Now, some say that there is something called, uh, of course, there is something called post-feminism. There is a fourth uh, wave as well. But I'm not going into all of these. These are uh, maybe part of another uh, session. But so... This is basically how we understand the three waves of feminism. Now, if you are here fully, you will see that the first wave is concerned with the 18th century 
to the early 20th century that is the it is the longest phase in terms of the the first wave and wollstonecraft's 1792 work wollstonecraft's vindication uh, the focus of our lecture today would be vindication because this is uh, primarily aimed at ug students who have vindication in their syllabus so uh, this is something that is covering this first particular wave but interestingly wollstonecraft is not talking of the suffragists the suffragists by the suffragists we mean the women who were fighting for the rights of the voting rights basically their rights to vote yes next um so this is another distinction actually now you see how these categorizations work because schwalter elaine schwalter this is uh, what we refer to as a literature of their own uh, by elaine schwalter in 1977 she is making these three categories one feminine second is feminist and the third is female so you see a different kind of a categorization based on a different premise but again something that corresponds with these three waves so here if you look at this she starts with 1840s 1840s to 1880s as an imitation of the mainstream male literary tradition whereas the feminist is a protest against the standards of this dominant tradition concerning social values and rights after the 1880s so you see wollstonecraft doesn't really feature in this distinction that schwalter ellen schwalter the american uh, feminist makes much later fine now one of the reasons uh, of this is that schwalter is uh, in all discourses or studies on feminism schwalter features uh, as one of the leading one of the pioneering one of the first one of the earliest figures who had influenced what we now understand as feminism uh, some uh, there was actually uh, some kind of a uh, what should i say denial of a schwalter being a feminist at all but now of course we include schwalter within uh, the the umbrella term of feminism but as such the feminism as a movement actually emerged much later now uh, so you see this problems of categorization will always be there and uh, so on the basis of this having understood we can go to the next slide having understood these we we will now uh, you know talk of what we understand or what we mean by or rather try to understand what is liberal feminism uh, go to on the next one uh can we have the next slide well in the next uh, yeah in the next slide what we what i'm uh, trying to look at is uh, a certain kind of an idea of liberal feminism which emerges interestingly with the idea of enlightenment liberalism now there are certain factors that that uh, bring together this whole notion of liberal feminism uh, or the certain tenets that that uh, bind uh, these feelings of liberal feminism together one is a faith in rationality second is a belief that uh, women's and men's souls and rational faculties are the same uh, women and men are therefore ontologically identical now this is something that wollstonecraft is repeatedly emphasizing that uh in terms of thinking in terms of the faculties in terms of the souls in terms of the uh, the intellectual capacities women and men are identical a belief in education therefore which is something that is connected to critical thinking and the individual as an isolated being pursuing rational thought uh as an isolated being means an individual uh separately pursuing by on his own pursuing rational thought as well as religion so so this was a certain kind of an idea that was emerging during the phase of liberal feminism and finally the doctrine of natural rights now one of the major beliefs during this time was the idea of or the doctrine of natural rights which uh, which which started believing in the idea that uh, human beings had certain inalienable rights which were naturally uh, you know uh, there for them which cannot be uh, connected to uh, what is uh, being practiced at present so this doctrine of natural rights became very important and this is something that is central to 
the ideas of liberal feminism. Yes, next. Now, along with that, we will look at the position of women during the 18th century. Having said that, if you if you had some doubts whether why should we at all say that men or women are the same? Because you see, when we are looking at Wollstonecraft's text, this is again uh, meant for the UG students. When we are looking at a text like Wollstonecraft's Vindication, we need to understand that this was published in 1792. So it, it is uh, looking at or it is talking of an 18th century worldview, which is entirely different from uh, the kind of uh, life that we lead today. So uh, let us see how women uh, were uh, having were enjoying what kind of rights were they enjoying during the 18th century. And you will see that all these points that you can see on your screen uh, begins with a no. So no property or legal rights. Women did not have any property rights. They, they did not have any legal rights as well. They did not have any voting rights. Voting rights would come much, much later. And much of feminism would be concerned with uh, women uh, being uh, or women getting voting rights, women's uh, rights as part of political participation as well. No proper career option. There was no career option because it was unthinkable that women would think of any kind of careers because it was women's place was des designated to be the, the boundaries of hope. And of course, no. This is also very interesting, but uh, let us understand that there were certain girls schools uh, or certain, uh, you know, certain certain places where girls actually went to learn. But these were entirely different from what we understand as public education today. And of course, there was a high mortality rate during, particularly during childbirth. Many women, many women died while, while giving birth to their children. So this is basically the situation. In the next slide, we look at certain uh, critical uh, you know, societies, the blue stockings, basically. The next slide. The next slide is about the blue stockings uh, of the 18th. Yeah, so uh, I'm sorry about this little uh, uh, problem. So the we were talking of the blue stockings. Now the blue stockings were a literary society primarily led by Elizabeth Montagu, and as you can see here later on, Hannah Moore and also Fanny Burney were noted blue stockings. Now what is interesting is that the blue stockings, uh, uh, although now there is a lot of work that is going on on the blue stockings. Uh, at that point of time, the term developed rather negative connotations, rather negative connotations referring to educated and intellectual women. Now, this was uh, uh, not something that was acceptable, uh, educated and intellectual women. Now, the blue stockings were also satirized and caricatured uh, in the next slide, as you can see. Uh, and there is also a quote from uh, William Hazlitt, which I have uh, referred to here. The blue stocking is the most odious character in society. She sinks wherever she is placed, like the yolk of an egg to the bottom and carries the filth with her. That's William Hazlitt speaking on the blue stockings. And in the next slide, uh, Gautam, can we have the next slides? Yeah, the next one. The next slide is actually uh, an image, yes. This is the caricature of the blue stockings, a painting by Rowaldson. And this painting is dated 1815. I would, uh, you can see this is just a caricature. And as you can see, the title is also there, Breaking Up of the Blue Stocking Club. Now, what is interesting to note here is that you will find, uh, if you look at the visual iconography of the period, uh, the paintings uh, in particular, a lot was, was concerned with caricatures. And much of these caricatures were directed at women, right? Uh, the point is that the Blue Stocking Club, because it was a primarily female-led, although men were invited to the Blue Stocking meetings, 
but it was primarily a female led a female intellectual a female um, literary kind of a club when the blue stocking club like many other clubs during that time broke up the reason that was attributed to was that women cannot uh, get together in an organized manner to lead uh, such an intellectual and a literary you know uh, club so therein lies the 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 bias the prejudice of a society which you can see very well i think in the caricature it's it's a chaos the scene of a chaos that rolson is trying to project right now, the next is uh, we we now shift towards women and education now women did not have as i told you women did not have careers so therefore uh, in the strict sense of the term women were not citizens also and because they neither did did they have careers nor were they citizens so there was no need for any kind of education also for them that was the basic belief that was prevalent belief and the next uh, yes the next most writers on the subject of female education as the next slide will show you uh war they prefer that women receive a practical and a religious training for the primarily domestic role that they were designated right and look at this byron lord byron what does he say women should read neither poetry nor politics nothing but books of piety and cookery okay so this is what lord byron has to say about women can you imagine now one uh, you know one advantage of looking at literature english literature culture um not only english but but all culture through a feminist lens is that it it allows you to uh, to to kind of demystify your uh, canonical masters and uh, i will also in the next slide move on to uh, uh, an instance from sheridan okay in the rivals where um, uh, to mr anthony absolute question Uh, this is how mrs malaprop is responding i will just ask you to read along with me observe me sir anthony i would by no means wish a daughter of mine to be a progeny of learning i don't think so much learning becomes a young woman you know this the use of the word becomes in those days so it doesn't fit it is not it is not uh, correct uh, for a young woman for instance am i okay kiki i won't allow her what I never let her meddle with greek or hebrew or algebra or simony or fluxions or paradoxes or such inflammatory branches of learning uh, and not not nor should uh, should she handle any of your mathematical astronomical diabolical instruments now these are of course the the new kind of uh, uh, physics physical machines that were coming up gradually uh, after since the renaissance in particular if you look at galileo's telescope if you look at newton then lots of these uh, you know physical instruments were being used by scientists but sir anthony i would send her at 9 years old to a boarding school in order to learn a little ingenuity and artifice okay so that is what is the purpose of education as mrs malaprop uh says now uh, women were therefore instead of education they were looking for a certain kind of an accomplishment okay women of genteel classes next slide uh were expected to gather gather accomplishments instead of a proper education so on the one hand is education a proper education or rather the education that we understand today and on the other lies the idea of accomplishments as a contrasting uh, education okay uh, the next slide yes uh, so and what are these accomplishments these included the ability to draw sing play music do needle work and speak modern non classical languages because the classical languages are reserved to be learned by the men so there's a huge distinction in terms of education when it comes to the between uh, men and women we can skip uh, two slides and move on now this uh, here we move on to mary wollstonecraft's life mary wollstonecraft's life uh, uh, we will briefly talk about it uh, why do we need to talk about it i will also say because as you can see uh, her personal life has been more focused and scrutinized than her work up to 
uh, what should I say, up to the early part of the 20th century, much of her attention on Wollstonecraft was because of her life. Now, what kind of a life it was? It was a tumultuous, unorthodox and a bohemian life by the 18th century standards. Very different, an alternative uh, life that Mary Wollstonecraft led. And today, when we uh, uh, look at her life, uh, shedding off uh, our inhibitions in particular, then we can see why uh, uh, Wollstonecraft was so different in terms of her, her you know, approach towards life. Now, yeah, the next, the poor, of course, she had poor financial con conditions because her father, who was a drunkard, he had uh, squandered all the wealth already that uh, they had inherited. And, uh, and Fanny Blood, one of, one of her most important childhood friendships was, would be Fanny Blood. Uh, with whom uh, Wollstonecraft would move on to establish a school at Newington Green. And she would start writing. She would also start writing around 1778. And she would leave home despite certain strong objections. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, certain strong objections for a long search for financial independence. Now, this is a very interesting point because at a time when women were confined to the house, Wollstonecraft dared to uh, move out and to, to for a search, for a long search for financial independence. And you know, as, as I already told you, women did not have careers. The only kind of careers that were available to women were either becoming a governess, which she did for a while, and or become a, becoming a writer. But you can understand probably that we can't just say, uh, okay, Chalo, let's become a writer overnight. We can't do that. So that Wollstonecraft had a uh, had a had a greater effort to give in in order to pursue her dreams. Now she got her friend uh, in a, in a, as a friend she got Joseph Johnson, with whom she published uh, Mary a Fiction, which was her first novel. The next slide, um, where uh, which was done in 1778. Yes, and this is a quote that I would like you to read from uh, Maria Fiction because many of her works, uh, Maria Fiction, I mean, both her novels, this, this is an earlier novel and there was a later novel, Maria or the Wrongs of Woman, which uh, she left unfinished. Both are, are close, I mean, closely parallels uh, her life and uh, her association with Fanny Blood and her efforts at learning. Remember that she was an autodidact. An autodidact is a phrase that means uh, women were, uh, that means somebody who is self-taught. Now, women during the 18th century, as we all probably know, were largely self-taught because they did not have these public institutions to go to. They were not allowed inside Oxford and Cambridge. So they were autodidacts and Wollstonecraft was self-taught. Mary also was self-taught. And this is where uh, Mary talks of her experience. As she learned to read, she per perused with avidity every book. <clears throat> that came into her way, ne neglected in every respect and left to the operations of her own mind. She considered everything that came under her inspection and learned to think. Right. So, uh, yeah, the next very interestingly, actually, in the next slide, we will see how uh, Wollstonecraft says uh, to her sister Everina in 1787. And this is a very famous line uh, that I was trying to become the first of a new genus that is. The, the woman author and was determined to pursue a career through writing. And she was now in London. She started meeting a, a new group of liberals and dissenters. If I get time, I will focus on, on them. Uh, and that was this included. This included Henry Fuseli. The next slide. Uh, Joseph Priestley, the radical William Godwin, William Blake, Thomas Paine, etc. Now, Henry Fuseli is interesting. Henry, I will I have just one uh, painting by Henry Fuseli to show to you, which is uh, in the next slide. Henry Fuseli's, uh, this is Henry Fuseli's The Nightmare. Yes, uh, this is Henry Fuseli's The Nightmare. And as you can see, Fuseli was, was very well known for the incorporating the supernatural and the ideas of the Gothic. Uh, and you can see, and this is, look at the title of the, the painting. This is The Nightmare. So the girl is almost dead, uh, but she's actually sleeping. And the, the image that is uh, on her, the monster, 
is 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 sitting on her is a is a is a projection of uh, her own psyche so you can imagine that early in the uh, i mean the late part of the 18th century such a, a painting reflects henry fuseli's minds i mean it's very advanced uh, and was anticipating psychoanalysis as well now uh, what happened was that since then uh, very wollstonecraft one of the most important uh, events in wollstonecraft's life would be going to france uh, when france is in turmoil when france uh, we can go to the next slide yeah the next one <clears throat> when france was in turmoil and france was basically in uh, after the french revolution it was in a difficult situation this is a plaque that uh, that uh, commemorates mary wollstonecraft but uh, all lots of things happened to wollstonecraft towards which i don't want to focus our attention here right now but she attempted suicide she had several failed love affairs and ultimately it was william godwin with whom wollstonecraft uh, was uh, finally steady but then she died while giving birth to her daughter in uh, quite early as i told you now <clears throat> having said that uh, we can take a look at the next slide which is a little digression and all of us know this but uh, i'll just like to point out that mary the daughter of william godwin and uh, wollstonecraft uh, was to later become mary shelley uh, the wife of uh, pv shelley and of course more importantly the author of frankenstein and another important detail is that uh, pv shelley was also born on 1792 which is the year of the publication of uh, wollstonecraft's vindication so one generation moving on uh, leaving on to the next generation and the next generation would be the romantics now yeah so so with this uh, i have briefly tried to introduce wollstonecraft and uh, her life and now i will move on to the to the text of vindication um, i i hear because because yeah I, i'm just about 30 minutes uh, into it so so the text of uh, wollstonecraft's vindication is my primary uh, interest here and i will briefly talk about it the certain the portions that that are there gautam you can uh, turn off the presentation for some time now so so we can discuss the text for a while now i will begin uh, the discussion about the text by quoting from william godwin now what does william godwin have to say here wollstonecraft considered herself as standing forth in defense of one half of the human species laboring under a yoke which through all the records of time had degraded them from the station of rational beings and almost sunk them to the level of brutes this is what godwin's memoirs has to say about wollstonecraft's vindication so something that uh, part, partly introduces partly introduces the premise of wollstonecraft's vindication now uh, i have learned that uh, the students of shadan chandra mahavidyalaya have chapters 1 and chapters 2 on your, uh, in your syllabus so i would be focusing on that but also uh, we cannot do away with the introduction so vindication has got an introduction and there is a dedication as well uh, which uh, wolstonecraft has dedicated uh, her work to charles morris de talleyrand uh, one of the french diplomats and there is this dedication is also worth reading actually but let us focus on the introduction to start off with now i will uh, i will briefly look at the screen and uh, talk about the important sections from these these parts now what does she do, do is using images from the natural world of plants and flowers this is how she begins she begins with a melancholy state of mind and uh, uh, she 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 says that women fade out much uh, earlier before they arrive at maturity now for this uh, why should this happen for this she blames a false system of education promoted by men who promote uh, by who project women as alluring mistresses alluring mistresses rather than affectionate wives and rational mother so this is where i come back to the title with which i began because wollstonecraft's focus is uh, wollstonecraft's effort is to uh, is to justify women uh, as uh, rational uh, mothers and affectionate wives rather than alluring mistresses now this is something that is very important and i will return to this so women are treated as a kind of subordinate beings 
and not as part of the human species. She accepts that men are physically superior and that is the law of nature and a noble prerogative. But men, uh, not satisfied with that, have endeavored to sink, uh, have endeavored to sink women further to see them merely as alluring mistresses once again. See, the word allure is very, very interestingly used by Wollstonecraft. And uh, what, what she tries to emphasize is the fact that uh, the, the allure uh, is a result of a certain kind of a false refinement, a false idea about accomplishment and elegance, okay, which is promoted in the name of education. And that is what she is trying to counter. Now, another interesting thing that uh, that Wollstonecraft raises in the introduction is the idea of masculine women. Note how Wollstonecraft distinguishes between imbibing physical prowess of men. And that is, she gives examples of hunting, shooting and gaming. On the other hand, sharing the intellectual arena of men, which 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 is what she wants, which is what she means by masculine women. And that would raise females in the scale of human being. She returns to the issue near the end of the chapter as well and almost reassures men that despite being masculine, women would be dependent on men in various matters. Now, I'm, really, I'm stressing this particular uh, area uh, deliberately because this assurance can be seen as a kind of a disclaimer, a kind of a disclaimer on the part of Wollstonecraft and stems from her possible anxiety. That and fear about patriarchal acceptance or rejection of our statements. Okay, so uh, why I'm emphasizing this is that uh, these there are certain sections where Wollstonecraft's disclaimers appear to be strange. Uh, she seems to be apologetic uh, in uh, by by saying that uh, I, I'm talking of masculine women. And then she is assuring that, no, by masculine women, I do not mean that they will, uh, you know, join hunting, gaming and, uh, you know, all sorts of such, such male activities. But by masculine, I mean uh, sharing the intellectual arena of men. So the, so the idea of masculinity as strongly connected to intellectual was already very prevalent during her times. Um, then she identifies certain interesting phrases. I find these phrases, uh, these, these uh, you know, phrases very, very important. Uh, one is soft phrases. The next is susceptibility of heart. Then is delicacy of sentiment. And then comes refinement of taste. All of these, what are these? These are phrases that men use in order to qualify women, right? Soft phrases, susceptibility of heart delicacy of sentiment, refinement of taste. And this is where Wollstonecraft is very critical. And she says that she, these are nothing but epithets of weaknesses. Uh, let us not forget that these are nothing but epithets of weakness and pretty feminine phrases, which are used condescendingly by men to soften the slavish dependence of women. So ultimately, uh, whatever the women are passing through is nothing but slavish dependence, but that needs to be buttered up that needs to be covered up by certain phrases like susceptibility of art or delicacy of, of, of sentiment. Now, therefore, Wollstonecraft's intentions are particularly one uh, to show that elegance is inferior to virtue. In vindication, virtue is very important. Reason, rationality, virtue, education. If you look at the keywords, if you look at it like keywords, then these are the specific keywords that Wollstonecraft has, has in mind. Um, and number two, so elegance is inferior to virtue. And number two, the object of ambition is to obtain a character as a human being, regardless of sex differences. Now, that is very important that Wollstonecraft emphasizes. So Wollstonecraft continuously criticizes the education of women, which is nothing but acquiring a smattering of accomplishments. She says that this such education is useless and, uh, you know, there should be a proper rational education that raises women in the quality of, of uh, beings, human beings. But note how, you know, as I already told you, there is a, she rather betrays a, a, a domestic sphere, a merely domestic sphere for her emancipated women even. Because by emphasizing uh, on the destination 
as, uh, uh, as, as I told you, affectionate wives and rational mothers. So the way Wollstonecraft wants women to be seen is nothing radical. And this is probably part of the idea of liberal feminism as well. Now, again, uh, it must be remembered that these are actually early days of any kind of writing about women before qualifying this as non-radical, before qualifying this as, uh, as, I, as I myself use the term, uh, you know, uh, apologetic. We must understand that any, these are early days of any writing about women's rights and therefore vindication is emphasizing equality for women and claims to explore the false systems of education for women that have promoted sufficiently to enslave the women's minds rather than enlarge those. And this is where I would like to quote from Caroline Porsmeer, who is very interestingly commenting this. Denied, I quote, denied education and inculcated with the idea that they were frivolous, irrational creatures. The early feminists saw the establishment of women as a fully rational human being was one of the first steps towards political, social, and legal equality. Right. So, um, you see, this this is something that we need to remember whenever we uh, are are considering any women writers, because uh, when the first early women writers are taking up the pen, then this act this act of writing itself is a kind of resistance. Okay. So, because these are difficult times. Uh, in through which Wollstonecraft is moving and others as well. Now we quickly move on to the first chapter. Now there is, you know that in Vindication, uh, Wollstonecraft follows a practice of, of giving a subtitle to all his uh, all our chapters. The rights, so the chapter first chapter is entitled The Rights and Involved Duties of Mankind Considered, where she asks three basic questions. So what are the qualities that makes man better than the brutes? Okay, the word brutes is, is quite used in Wollstonecraft, reason, virtue, and experience. But uh, she says that man has squandered all these, uh, you know, great elements. And uh, she moves on to criticize here hereditary honors, but in particular, by using the phrases like uh, desire of dazzling by riches, pleasure of commanding, flattering psychophants, leading to the sacrifice of liberty. So the hereditary honors and monarchy is strongly attacked by Wollstonecraft here. Now, this is again a very strong and a bold move that Wollstonecraft makes because in those days, uh, attacking the, the, the monarchy, attacking the aristocracy, attacking the hereditary the whole practice of dazzling by riches, uh, the practice of, of, of you know, accumulating wealth, is strongly criticized. And then she moves on to other professions where uh, a great subordination of rank constitutes its power. And what are those? These are standing army, the sailors, and the clergy, and she, which she refers to as pestiferous purple, which renders the progress of civilization a curse. Now, therefore, authoritative regimes and professions are worn by Wollstonecraft. The first chapter is also introductory in spirit. Because Wollstonecraft is identifying our premise, our basic premise. Now, we need to understand that since Wollstonecraft's key aim is to vindicate the rights of women, this would require a deconstruction of patriarchal institutional beliefs and systems of control. Her attack on the sacred majesty of kings and other such hierarchical professions is hence a prelude to her attack on the patriarchal institutions of power and control towards which she is moving. And this is basically happening in the later part of the chapter, the other chapters. The first three chapters are basically introductory in nature. Now, the second chapter is where uh, things become more interesting. Uh, and this second chapter is entitled The Prevailing Opinion of a Sexual Character Discussed. Now, very interestingly, you see the prevailing opinion and sexual character. Now, in those days, uh, the idea or the term social construction of gender probably wasn't uh, yet uh, available, wasn't wasn't there. But by prevailing opinion, uh, Wollstonecraft is actually suggesting the social construction of gender. Now, uh, this is also a, a chapter where Wollstonecraft takes up Milton, where Wollstonecraft takes up uh, Rousseau, and Wollstonecraft also takes up um, Gregory, John Gregory. 
right? And criticizes them. And this is very interesting that uh, uh, if you look at what Rousseau has to say in uh, in Sophie. Now, remember, Rousseau, Jean Jacques Rousseau was one of the uh, greatest enlightenment figures, one of the champions of the French Revolution, the ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity. But what has Rousseau to say about women? That is what Wollstonecraft blasts. And Wollstonecraft also is, is uh, you know, Rousseau is one of the ideals for Wollstonecraft as well. But what is his views about women? Uh, this is something that is revealed in his Emil. I'll just quote that uh, women should be made a coquettish slave in order to render her a more alluring object of desire. A sweeter companion to man whenever he chooses to relax himself. So you see, vindication is full of such uh, such uh, offensive quotes uh, that that are from uh, male authors primarily, which Wollstonecraft strongly criticizes. So what Rousseau does is thus he reduces the existence of women to the only goal of satisfying their men and women, their men. And Wollstonecraft obviously objects to it. Next, Wollstonecraft critiques Dr. Gregory's advices to women. Dr. Gregory is, of course, the famous Dr. John Gregory, and his famous book was uh, uh, Father's uh, Legacy uh, to His Daughters, which was published in 1774. And these kind of books were known as conduct books during the 18th century. Uh, there was a whole lot of conduct books that were written uh, during this uh, time period. Interestingly, the majority of such conduct books were almost always directed at the woman. That is what kind of conduct uh, uh, women should, uh, what is proper for women, what is right for women, how should they behave, how should they walk, how should they talk, what should they learn. So all these were, were uh, concerns of the authors and most of the authors had to uh, instruct women regarding this. Uh, men were left out, of course. Uh, so which is a favor of which is in favor of cultivating a fondness for dress. Now, Gregory is saying that you should saying women, of course, that you should cultivate a fondness for dress and you should uh, go against uh, the display of delicacy of sentiment. Uh, both ideas, Wollstonecraft rem reminds us, emerge from a love of power and a false system of education. Now, Wollstonecraft seeks to answer these through uh, number one, education, a proper education for women. Number two, bodily strength. That is something that is very interesting that Wollstonecraft always uh, you know, refers to, is that women should develop bodily strength, physical strength. Um, and thirdly, a more rational and equitable status for women. Therefore, Wollstonecraft is, as you can see, is critical of Rousseau, is critical of Gregory. And in the later sections of uh, the indication, if you read, I would request uh, the students particularly to read chapter five, where uh, Wollstonecraft actually picks up Rousseau in more detail. And in the later chapters also, Wolstonecraft picks up uh, uh, for James Fordyce, the author of the sermons for women and, uh, uh, and John Gregory as well, particularly the uh, authors of the male conduct uh, books and criticizes them. Right. So uh, this was the part of uh, uh, the text that I had to, to, to talk of. And now can we, uh, Gautam, can we return uh, in the brief time that is left? Can we return to the, to the slideshows? Yeah, the next, go to the next slide. Now, this is something interesting that I would like to, uh, like you to see <laughs> is an image. Yes, this is an image uh, of Mary Antoniat. As you know, Mary Antoniat, the French queen, was guillotined, uh, the French queen, during uh, the French Revolution. Now, if you remember the, the idea, I told you that I would like to return to the idea of the alluring mistresses, the, the, the phrase uh, in particular, and, uh, and the notion of elegance as well. And all both of these are uh, very, very, uh, you know, uh, very evident in this painting that uh, of Mary Antonia. I would uh, uh, ask the students who are listening to this and looking at this image as well to guess uh, what age might this uh, woman be who is sitting and posing here. Uh, of course, this is Mary Antonia. And I will give you five seconds to think uh, about it, and then I will provide the answer because uh, there's no uh, uh, there's no uh, 
possibility of uh, interacting right now at least uh, yeah so these 5 seconds are over and uh, this is meri atonia at 13 13 right she was ju just before her marriage and uh, she she got married uh, oi around 13 and 14 uh, to uh, louis the 16th now what i'm what i'm trying to suggest why i'm referring to this is because uh, at a very from a very early age these women these girls actually who had not yet become women were however uh, you know promoted were however uh, projected as if uh, they were women and they were taught uh, this whole idea of allure this whole idea of of cultivating a certain kind of an elegance right and this is how the the whole uh, accomplishments were were subservient to now fine now we have done we are done with the text and we are done with this now we we will briefly move on to the legacy or the responses to mary wollstone craft so you have got some kind of an idea of the text i believe after our brief discussion now what do you think uh, what did you think of this uh, i would say many of us who are uh, who are liberal in our minds would 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 be uh, would be would be flabbergasted at at this a kind of uh, you know approach that the men had towards women and do we find anything wrong with 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 wollstone craft that is a kind of uh, moral judgment if we have to make but ironically you know this is why i'm why i'm saying this is that if you look at the legacy of wollstone craft then the first 100 years after the publication of vindication was terrible actually now let us look at this we start with godwin's memoirs and part of this was because of godwin and his memoirs because godwin's memoirs had devastated mary wollstone craft's public reputation now this was by william godwin and william godwin didn't mean any harm because william godwin wanted to project the uh, a very sincere portrayal of the different fallings the failings uh, and the life that the passionate life that wollstone craft led but the audience was not ready for it and uh, you see the memoirs became a great scandal and saudi also pointed out that uh, godwin had not shown uh, any kind of feeling in stripping his dead wife naked if you look at the responses from contemporary women the next slide uh, then we will see that as virginia sapiro points out her attackers implied or stated that no self respecting woman would read her work and this this was true because uh throughout the 19th century very few uh would actually read her work and so so what i'm saying is that if this is partly because of wollstone craft's vindication uh her bold stance that she took which nowadays which when we look uh, at from the 21st century standpoint seems not bold at all but the bold stance that she took at the during that time and partly because of godwin's uh, uh memoirs uh Horace Walpole called her Hyena in petticoats and uh, again we will move uh, towards an image the next one the next slide is an image which is as you can see uh, a caricature by David Levine during that time uh, what what uh, impression does this caricature we usually when we when in class i give greater time uh, for these uh, paintings and we discuss at length with our students so uh, give these images a thought these are these are all available on the internet you can look for these images and then you can rethink and uh, maybe write a few lines also about this so again this is the typical uh, you know the angry woman uh, particularly uh, the which is being portrayed and this is again a, a kind of a caricature now we, if you go to the next one the other interesting thing that i would like to talk of which is again a, a a very unfortunate and a virulent you know attack on to wollstone craft is richard polwills the unsexed females this was published in 1798 uh, as i as as you can see it was uh, it was a virulent attack and it also points to the difficulties which were faced by the unconventional women author during the the 18th century now what does polwill do nobody remembers polwill uh, apart from the fact that polwill had written this uh, this this terrible poem called the unsexed females but what it uh, why is it important is that it tells us how difficult was the woman's course 
uh, during the 18th century when Wollstonecraft was right. Yes, the next one is the, where Paulville basically attacks Wollstonecraft for being uh, un-Christian or anti-Christian and radical as well. Now, unsexed, uh, the unsexed females. Uh, yeah, go to the next slide. <clears throat> the unsexed, yeah, the unsexed word for Paulville actually means something, something that violates uh, what he defines as a woman's proper role. And he sees these women as insubordinate, immoral, and not feminine. Because you see, this, this, this image of the feminine women was, was very much uh, what the patriarch, what patriarch did always wanted. And Wollstonecraft uh, and, of course, you know, other, uh, others like her did not provide a proper and positive model for the chaste, sentimental, and subordinate femininity that uh, people like Paul Will were always looking forward. There are two. Therefore, uh, what Paul Will does is next uh, in the next slide. Uh, the yeah, these are these are um, a few lines from the unsexed females. I just read this once. Survey with me what never our fathers saw: a female band despising nature's law, as proud defiance flashes from their arms, and vengeance smothers all their softer charms. Vengeance smothers all their softer charms. As long as it is softer charms, patriarchy is happy. But the moment uh, vengeance is, is there, uh, uh, no, 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 you are not the right person for us. Okay, so this was Richard Polwill. As I told you, Richard Polwill has largely been forgotten, but for his, his infamous uh, attack uh, on uh, Wollstonecraft. There are other aspects of this also, which I'm not going into. Let us go to the next image. Uh, the next image is again another painting which I would like you to uh, look at. Uh, you, can, you can give another click, Gautam. Uh, <coughs> yeah, it is a painting by, as you can see, George Cruikshank, and the date is 1819. Now, if you look at the, look carefully at the, at the painting once again. Again, a, a kind of a projection, again, a caricature, again, a projection of chaos. But this chaos has got very specific political, uh, religious significance and, and it's got a very strong uh, subversive text uh, within it and uh, uh, well well the if you can I don't know if you can see it properly or not but the earth is burning and uh, it's burning in the foreground is the guillotine the guillotine which we associate so strongly with the reign of terror and you can see blood all around and uh, it's it's again a chaos and uh, if you are careful, you will see the scepter and the, the, the crown also lying in the floor, which are symbols of the, the, the king, right? So this is the painting, very interestingly, is the radical's arms. And uh, the banner, in the banner, you can see the banner flying with the French flag. Uh, no God, no religion, no king, no constitution is written on the banner. Now, this is a, a strongly anti-revolutionary painting. And this brings us uh, to the last focus of my discussion today. That is the French Revolution. Because without talking about the French Revolution, uh, it would be unfair to, to talk of Mary Wollstonecraft, right? So the next, uh, the next thing that we move on to briefly is the idea of the pamphlet war. Now, of course, there's a lot to be said, but uh, just, just remember that the French Revolution in 1789 was a major event of the time. It was the first revolution as such, and uh, since then, world has, the world has never been the same. But the French Revolution had also uh, stemmed, had also uh, led on to a tremendous revolution controversy and what is understood as the pamphlet war. Now, in the pamphlet war, uh, yeah, the next one. So just before the French Revolution was the declaration of the American independence, which was another uh, landmark event uh, of, of sorts. Now, the French Revolution, what, we, what is important is that it had also sparked off an intellectual debate. As you can see here, whether there is any justification of such a revolution and the question of liberty in a pamphlet war. Okay, so whether such a revolution is justified or not, and, uh, you know, how do we really look at the question of liberty? And this happened in, in, in a pamphlet war. Uh, there were several pamphlets that were circulated 
against each other in this revolution controversy. And I've listed in the next slide, you will find a list of the most important of these. The most important in the sense, the most significant of these, right? The first was in 1789 when Rich, Dr. Richard Price, a close associate of uh, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's, uh, someone who had influenced Mary Wollstonecraft to a great extent, was on the love of uh, the country, where he was talking of the notion of perfectibility and, uh, you know, other uh, as well. I'm sorry, I just want a call came because I'm using the mobile. Uh, right. Uh, <clears throat> so, so uh, ah, in 1790 is is the next uh, is the next um, you know work is it's it's Bark. This time, Bark is responding to Dr. Richard Price with his reflections on the revolution in France. And in 1790, Wollstonecraft it comes with her first vindication. Actually, Wollstonecraft has two vindications. The first vindication is vindication of the rights of men. And then comes Thomas Paine's rights of men. And then comes Wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of women. So all these texts can be seen. Of course, there were hundreds of pamphlets and texts that were written, which were seen, which are seen as part of the revolution controversy. But... Uh, you know this last, uh, but but these are the most influential and the most significant. Now you see Edmund Burke's uh, position is very significant because Edmund Burke uh, strongly criticized the revolution, and uh, what he was trying to argue was that this replacement of the rights of man uh, or replacement of the rights of kings with the rights of man would be blasphemous, would be anti-Christian. And therefore, Wollstonecraft uh, responded to Barr. So this, this debate was very strong. And this is where the idea of what is very significant is that while starting from Rousseau, while everybody was were talking of liberty, everybody were talking of equality, but this equality, ironically, did not extend for women. Nobody thought of voting, uh, giving women political participation. So in, in a certain way or the other, this, this whole, their version of equality was very, you know, was very complicated and not as, uh, you know, inclusive as we might uh, have thought it to be. So that is where Wollstonecraft's vindication becomes so important. You see, both vindication has usually been read as a text. Uh, of uh, about the rights of woman as one of the primary texts about the rights of woman, but 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 vindication is what is also crucial about vindication is that we need to place this text in the context of the French Revolution controversy as well, and this is something that is very important. Right now, carrying on with the uh, in a, in a way carrying on with the legacy. This is the last slide. Uh, I end on a positive note. With with uh, with certain interesting comments from uh, two of her later admirers. Now the situation, as far as Wollstonecraft's response is concerned, uh, changes starts changing with the 20th century very slowly, but it starts changing. And this is Virginia Woolf who says uh, she is alive and active. She argues and experiments. We hear her voice and trace her influence even now among the living. This is in 1929, and Adriana Rich, in a very famous tribute to Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, I would request the students to read these four lines. These are wonderful lines. Thus wrote a woman, partly brave and partly good. None of us are perfect. Okay. So thus wrote a woman, partly brave and partly good, who fought with what she partly understood. Few men about her would or could do more. So she was labeled harpy, shrew, and war. So that sums up kind of the, the life of Mary Wollstonecraft. And this also tells us uh, uh, the difficulty that Wollstonecraft had to uh, go through as a woman, as an individual. Now, one of the problems, one of the problems of uh, uh, approaching any feminist text is that uh, you cannot detach life. You might say, why? Uh, I was, I have talked about so much about her life, but, but you see, uh, 
for a feminist, it's not just about uh, the, the writing. It's not just about uh, the critical aspects of what she writes, but it's about the lived reality through which she passes. And with that, I think, yes, Gautam, I will conclude. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. The word thank is insignificant to convey for this enthralling session. And I think, uh, can't you hear me? What I'm saying you, uh, what I'm telling, basically I'm enthralled to get this, basically I'm enthralled to get this lecture. Thank you. And like me, uh, all of the participants who have joined here, they also uh, thoroughly got in trial. I can tell you this intriguing session. And thank you very much for this uh, wonderful lecture. And um, uh, okay, I'm just uh, taking on question. Uh, it, it cannot be questioned, but uh, basically from a student's point of view, this question is there. Uh, I'm taking this, this is a question. Basically, what uh, uh, Proyan Boidu, this is please say some important question from this chapter, it's okay. So from the exam point of view that he has asked this question to you. I, I really understand, no, no, I, I, I understand this uh, because this is one of the most important, uh, you know, problems that the students have to fa face. Uh, but you see, uh, what should I, I don't know how to respond to that. There are many issues that are there. Uh, what is Wollstonecraft's attitude to uh, particularly Rousseau uh, for Dice and John Gregory, and so these authors, uh, male authors particularly, how she criticizes them. Uh, this is one important Wollstonecraft's attitude to women also, because you see, Wollstonecraft is very critical of women as well, because uh, Wollstonecraft, much like her, Wollstonecraft was, was, was angry with her mother. Uh, because uh, her father often beat her mother, used to beat her mother. And in those days, you know, abuses on women were very common. And her mother did not, did never protest. She accepted it as her fate. This was, you know, even in Bengal, this has uh, been a situation. So Wollstonecraft is also critical of women that uh, they should not be, you know, swayed away by uh, these, these, as I told you, those, those pretty feminine phrases. So how is Wollstonecraft also critical of women is important. How is uh, Wollstonecraft critical of the uh, say, for example, the monarchy, uh, the positions of power that she wishes to, uh, you know, criticize. Uh, yes. Uh, anything else, Gautam? Uh, right now, I don't find any question, but I think that everyone is in child with your lecture. So they didn't find uh, the time to write that question. I hope that they are getting time to write that question if they have anything in their mind. So just, uh, okay. Uh, If you have any question, if, if any participant has any question, you can drop because I understand that as the session was very engaging, so you might not get the time to write your question. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, no, no, uh, no fine. That's fine. Uh, I am available. Just tell them that if they have any questions later on, also, uh, you can uh, pass on those yeah, questions yes, uh, yes. over email, and I would be more than happy to respond. Uh, to any kind okay. of issues, as you always do, public. as you always do. Okay, uh, so, as uh, I'm not getting any question, I I don't know exactly whether they're right typing it or not. But right now there is no question in this uh, comment box except this one. This so everyone um, uh, has enjoyed your lecture, uh, and I'm not particularly mentioning any name because this is comment box, so I'm not taking it on the screen. And um, once again, thank you very much for uh, joining us and delivering such a wonderful, such an engaging session uh, we have got from you. And we are really very, uh, what should I say? We are really very uh, thankful to you that uh, uh, you have delivered such a wonderful no, no. lecture. It was my pleasure uh, as well. Powerful. Thank you. And I hope the next time, whenever we need you, and definitely you will be available for us for another session. Uh, so on this note, thank you very much, sir, for joining us and for delivering. Uh, uh, such a wonderful uh, lecture, sir. So uh, just be there. I'm leaving you from the screen. 
and I would like to talk to you for a few minutes. Just start removing me from the screen. So, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this is session number uh, 19, and our session number 20 is going to take place on 28th August Friday. Uh, the time is a little bit different. That will uh, take place from 8 p.m., not 7 p.m., because the guest is from uh, California, so time uh, there is some time problem is there. So that's why this this session of the uh, the upcoming session will take place from 8 p.m. onwards. Uh, and um, on that session, we're going to have Professor uh, Otto. And uh, he's from uh, a very renowned university of USA, Stanford University. And uh, do join us on August, on 28th, August Friday. I hope that that session will be very much engaging like this one. So on this note, thank you very much for joining once again. Stay safe, stay protected. Good night.